You're live. We're live. Welcome to ACAB Radio, changing the hearts and minds one listener at a time. Presented by Nevada Coplock and Food Not Bombs Las Vegas. Be sure to check us out at our websites at nbcoplock.org and foodnotbombslasvegas.org. We are podcasting live from Happy Earth Market. Go to happyearthmarket.com and see their community building activities and events. We're your hosts. We have Special K, Jay Lifer, and I'm King Rum. That's our rap names. <laughs> it is. We do rap all the time. All right, so Kelly, what uh, inspired you to get involved in activism? Well, I, I first started Actually, I mean, I was involved a little bit, like, way younger through, like, art and stuff, but um, when I first started getting involved in activism, it was through Food Not Bombs, and uh, just the, the community spirit of going out and helping people that need help and really reintegrating people that are homeless to get back into society, because a lot of times people are, they're dumped on, they're treated like they're not actually people. And so it's it's um, it's not only good for the for the people; it's good for the society because you, you take these people and you make them kind of a hostile part of the society, and, and it works against society in general. And then obviously it hurts the people that are in that unfortunate situation. And so I I started getting involved in police issues as part of that because the police harass homeless people constantly. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, to a certain extent, it's a policy of governments and of the police. They, uh, they don't want people to see homeless people. And they will go out and harass homeless people and try to give them tickets for like jaywalking or whatever they can mm-hmm. to try to build some sort of record against them. And the prevailing theory on that is that if somebody has a record and they commit some sort of serious crime, then they can be put away for you know in prison. The problem with that is that the vast majority of people never do that. So mm-hmm. it's you know it's maybe five percent of the homeless population. They just want to you know establish a record, right. kind of build a case and you know rap sheet on them. Right, so they can pick them right. up and then so next well, time they see them. It's, part, it's partly control because if they have records and they have a warrant which goes with those citations because they can't pay the citations, so it becomes a warrant, mm-hmm. then they can hold that over them and they can control them. But if they don't do what they say, then they arrest them. Yeah. Right, then they're essentially being arrested for being impoverished or poor. Mm-hmm. This is what it, it boils down to. It's, it's criminalizing homelessness and, and poverty. poverty in general. It's... A lot of it's bullying, but it's an extension of that. So you have people that are bullies, and that's an easy target, and it's somebody they can't fight back, they can't hire a lawyer, they can't, go, you know, they can't afford to be in jail for long periods of time. And so, what really happens is the ma- vast majority of people never create, never commit that serious crime, but now they have a record, and it's harder for them to get a job, so they stay homeless longer just perpetuates the cycle. And yep. it's also, it creates that hostility, and it creates, it, it actually creates crime when you really look down into it, it's because what happens is people, they don't feel a part of the society, and they don't feel, you know, they feel hostility toward people. Mm-hmm. So they actually do go out and commit crimes, because they just don't care. Yeah, that's what so. attracted me to Food Not Bombs, was just the community that it builds, and you know, help these people to feel like, you know, they're, they're cast aside and we try to, um, you know, bring them back into the community and let them know that there are people out there that do care and want to help, you know. Right, we, we humanize them. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the issues is that um, for the general population, they'll see someone who they perceive as homeless and may be homeless and they tend to cast their eyes away and they dehumanize that person. So we definitely do bring back that human element. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good for the community in that respect. Uh, these are our fellow human beings and deserve all the respect 
that everyone's got. It's not just uh, the, all these other greater economic means. So I'm with you on that 100%. Absolutely. What about you, Ron? What got you inspired <clears throat> to uh, activism? Well, it's kind of interesting. I, I've always um, kind of been into it. I used to run a government food program uh, back in Brooklyn, New York. And I don't even think the term activism or activist was even around at that point. You know, it was doing what we're supposed to be doing. I was raised that, you know, you help your neighbors and you help your community. And then of course life, you know, gets in the way and I did different things and moved around a lot. And, um, you know, help with different organizations uh, wherever I wound up. And I wound up moving to Las Vegas and was fortunate enough to find uh, Food Not Bombs and, uh, you know, doing some research on it, and what a tremendous organization, and what a beautiful idea. I was, you know, uh, hooked right in, and I've been sticking with it now for quite a while. I met some really great people that keep me energized and motivated, um, and I see the good that we do. I mean, it's not theory. I'm, I'm out there uh, on the street, and I, I actually see the good that's created. So. When we're doing our community picnics, uh, we really are building community, and we're building community for all. Um, you know, it's not that Food Not Bombs just helps people who are homeless. Um, we help anybody who wants to come over and share a meal. I mean, you know, whether you know, you're just out walking in the park or guys who are working around their lunch hour mm -hmm. want to come by, we sit and talk. And as people get to, to know one another, there's this um, myth out there that somehow the homeless uh, population seems to be more dangerous mm -hmm. than the, you know, the outstanding population. And yeah. once you start bringing together people who have homes or people who are homeless and they talk and they start finding out that they have uh, things in common, then you know, we start tearing down those walls and building bridges. And they realize, you know, these people aren't these monsters that are created, um, you know, by the myths that are put out there by some of the government agencies and of the uh, social service organizations. But they're actually people just like every other person. There's good and bad, and they have their ups and downs, and, you know, they like sports, and some of them are artists and musicians, and, you know, they're just like, everyone else we're all the same when you get down to it and that's one of the greatest things absolutely yeah I, I noticed that too just from being out there um, at Circle Park every time a government organization would come in um, you know to help but they would bring police and marshals with them and that's you know people driving by see that and it just perpetuates that myth that the homeless are dangerous you know we go out there and we get nothing but love from these people, so I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I get why they do it. It's just to perpetuate that myth, for sure. But um, if well, we, it keeps them in a job. I, I mean, yeah, you know, if you're getting six figures, um, and you're there to help the homeless, if you actually, um, you know, create programs that there was no more homeless people to serve, then you just put yourself out of a job. And I don't really yeah. believe they want to do that <coughs> so it's kind of important for them to well, they, keep their job well the other thing is that people realize when they go out with groups like food on bombs that there's not that much of a gap between especially in today's society and today's economy there's not that much of a gap between you and the guy in the park mm -hmm. and not all the people that we, we do are homeless some people are just don't have a lot of money some people they might have a choice between eating and paying their power bill. Yeah. And if we can provide them the food, then they don't have to make that choice and it makes it better for them. And it's something where they might not end up homeless because they have the money to pay their rent because they didn't have to spend a bunch of money on food. And the other thing is that um, it's not just a passive thing. The government has declared Food Not Bombs a terrorist group, officially. Pennsylvania, they had the FBI infiltrating uh, the Quakers, who were part of not who not bombs, but who were part of a group that was uh, giving out food to people that needed it. And 
the government actively will undermine and try to destroy anything that provides an alternative to the government. If, if you are convincing people that the government is necessary, they will come and, and try to eliminate you. Yeah, they don't want to see anarchy successful. So anytime they see that, they definitely step in and try to, whether it's arresting people or issuing citations, there's definitely a war on poverty going on. We've seen it more and more recently in California and other states passing legislation you know, banning sharing food. Like, I don't, I don't understand how you can make a law and deem it illegal to share food. Right, and, and that actually happened here in 2006, and there were people that were arrested and people that had citations. And, um, Gail Sacco was one of them, and um, other members of her family, including uh, Joe Sacco, her son. And I know Gail, when I first became involved in Food Not Bombs, which was, 2009, she still had the citation and she was still going through the courts with it from 2006. And I think it was until 2011 before it was resolved. So, and she won it, that fight, right? Yeah, well, it was a, it was a settlement where uh, they made some concessions about like part of the thing is once they made it illegal, that got overturned pretty quickly because part of the the wording of it was that if you appeared that you would qualify for government services, then you could not offer somebody food. So it was based on appearance, and that was pretty clearly not constitutional, so it was overturned pretty quickly. So they did other stuff, and one of the things they did was uh, requiring permits. So they would have, I think it was 30 people, that you, you, you needed a permit after 30 people. So they would count everybody in the park, even if they weren't with you. So that was their way of Forcing permits and permits are one of those things that the government uses to exclude people. It's not used to, you know. I mean, the the, the basis of that word is permission. So mm -hmm. you're asking the government for permission to do something that you should be allowed to do anyway. Yeah. And the fact that the government can turn down those permits and not even give you a reason is how they exclude people that they don't want doing something. Mm -hmm. So. I know one of the concessions was that it had to be 75 people before they required a permit. Right, they upped the number of people. Yeah. So there was, there were, I don't know the exact details of it, but there were some concessions by the government and it was, it was basically just, uh, it came to the point where they wanted to get rid of it. So this, this was before I started getting involved in Food Not Bombs, but since I've been there, I've noticed they've kind of resorted to dirtier tactics like, um, watering, like over watering the park on days that they're not even supposed to be watering just to kind of drive drive them out. And I remember the first day of winter that it was actually really cold out here was the first day that, you know, we showed up for Food Not Bombs and we noticed that they were doing that. And uh, I, was, I was just shocked seeing everybody with their all their belongings soaking wet. It was just despicable. Yeah, they, they've done it to other parks also. I mean, our park is unique also is that they also restricted the hours. Um, so they make sure that the police officer there, uh, just prior to those hours, I believe it's 8 a.m., so they're there at like, you know, 7.45, and if you just happen to be stepping into the park at that time, uh, they run up and harass you. Mm -hmm. The same thing uh, at five o'clock when it closes, yeah. which is the only park in Vegas that has those hours. Mm -hmm. I've never seen another one. Um, well, they'll come through and sweep. And the other thing about that is their, their <coughs> final thing when they were trying to figure out a way to enforce this law against uh, feeding homeless people at Circle Park was they actually just closed the park. And the park was closed for, I think, five years. Oh, wow. <coughs> so it was just sitting there in the middle of the road, empty. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And then um, when they finally opened it, it took about six months before we could get them to open the bathrooms. And then... They would complain that people were going to the bathroom in public, even though they had locked the bathrooms. Because so they created the problem, right? Well, because <laughs> so you know, they had something to complain <coughs> about. If you lock the bathroom, people don't have to go to the bathroom anymore. You know, so. Yeah. So, so if uh, anybody wants to get involved in Food Not Bombs, uh, we have a Facebook group, Facebook page, website, foodnotbombslasvegas.org. Um, whether it's to donate, uh, there's a GoFundMe set up. If you have more money than time, if you 
have more time than money, then we can always use an extra pair of hands out at Circle Park. It's um, Sunday, Monday, and Wednesdays. Uh, yeah, we could use all the help we can get. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, do you want to talk about uh, next segment, about what's going to be going on? Um, should, uh, yeah, so this show is going to be about um, the 1 October shooting and uh, how the Metro... Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has handled the investigation um, to date and the subsequent protests that followed because of the lack of transparency and just um, survivors and average citizens and even the media wanting answers, wanting the truth and Metro refusing to release it. So we actually have a speaker that's going to um, call in uh, who is a survivor from Route 91. Uh, his name's Shannon. I actually met him at uh, one of our protests. It was at the Metro headquarters. Um, there's a few survivors there, but I remember talking to Shannon, and uh, we've stayed in touch over the time. Uh, so we're going to bring him on, um, see if we can get a hold of him. Yeah. It should be very interesting to hear uh, from somebody who was there at the time and get his take. Um, the Broward County, I believe, um, with their tragedy, it was uh, police officers that didn't uh, act. And there's also cases here where we found out that there were police officers outside uh, not responding while people were being murdered. Yeah, they waited in the stairwell and were given a stand down order until SWAT showed up. And it was over an hour. And until they finally active, breached the room, yeah, there was an active shooting going on. It's unbelievable. 75 minutes they sat in that room. So, <coughs> how was... Yeah. Hey, Shannon, it's Joey. How you doing? Can you hear me okay? I hear you now, yeah. Alright, we can hear you good, too. How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. You still out uh, on vacation out in Cali? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I, um, did you make it out to that six-month vigil that they had um, at the, the site? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, how was that? It was pretty good. Uh, I'd say there were about 400 people. Oh, wow. Uh, did, uh, did you see Ramsey there, Ramsey Dennison? Yeah, so I was um, saying how, how we met. Um, I met you at the Metro protest outside of uh, Metro headquarters, and um, we've been in contact ever since. And uh, I know there was a couple other survivors there that um, also did interviews with Ramsey. And um, I just wanted to bring you on to um, get your thoughts and your feelings on how Metro's been handling this whole investigation. I mean, I know you're not you know, anti-cop by any means. Um, you know, there there were certainly some heroes that night. I know I've seen body camera footage of cops going towards the gunfire and cops that had, you know, probably saved lives that night. Um, so my beef, the reason why I um, organized these protests was not against cops, you know, that their actions that night. It's how the higher ups handled the investigation after the fact. And I know there's a lot of survivors that also um, are frustrated with what's going on. So, um, uh, like in particular, the most recent development I can think of is Metro being ordered by the courts to release, you know, uh, video footage, body cameras, 911 calls, that sort of thing. And they're, they want to charge almost a half a million dollars for the media to get answers. And um, so I just wanted to see um, how does that make you feel? You know, do you think that's right? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know the truth about everything, just like everybody else. 
Yeah, we all want answers. Definitely, um, I agree with you there. Uh, Joe Lombardo being one of them. He, uh, you know, first of all, the lies and the cover-ups that have been coming out with this investigation. Um, the fact that they covered up that an officer discharged a firearm in the room, you know, for what was it a month? They covered that up, um, lying about check-in dates, and you know, so so once they do these sorts of things, it makes it hard. It, 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 you know, it's their credibility is completely trashed, so it's hard to just take their word for it. So that's why I think it's important that we see these documents, we see the, the footage, so that people can determine what happened. You know, um, I know you. I know you saw that they, uh, the New York Times released the uh, footage of Paddock in the Mandalay Bay. Finally, I mean, after what was it like five months? Yeah, it's creepy, huh? Creepy seeing him bring all that stuff up. Um, well, that's part of the thing is that, first of all, they declared that he was the only one and that there was no other suspects like a half an hour after it happened before there was any chance they could have investigated and found that out. Yeah, they didn't even bother so, to look into see if there so was So they put themselves it. in that box that they had to like adhere to that from the beginning. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, when you look at other shootings like you know the ones in Florida and that stuff those videos like of, of the people that did the shooting going around and like entering the places and stuff, those things came out within days oh, or yeah. weeks it's never been months and years before the, you know a shooting you know you might not have all of the information because they're still doing some investigations but like routine video of like him walking around the casino and stuff like that normally if this would have been like one of those other shootings Stuff. You you see those videos like on the news that night. Yeah. You know these routine videos of, of them walking around. Stuff. Yeah. Even the other terrorist attacks that happened. Um, I know there was one in New York where the guy had a backpack and a bomb that malfunctioned. It went off, but it didn't hurt anybody. Thank God. But that video was released the same day. And then there was a guy. Um, another. I think it was in New York. They showed footage of him. You know, within a few days. So. Um, I think I think it's good that they released it, you know some video, but um, I think that's just a start. You know the Mandalay Bay didn't have hallway cameras, so I think it's important that they release all the video footage from the elevators, uninterrupted, unedited, um, during Paddock's whole stay, so that we can see who was on that floor that shouldn't have been there because there were leaked um, room service receipts showing that there were. Um, uh, clearly he placed an order for two people. There was a charger found in his room that didn't match any of his seven cell phones. He had seven cell phones. Like, that's that's perfectly normal, you know? Yeah. yeah. Shannon, um, I just had a, a quick question. I mean, as we progress, um, you know, with the case and everything, I'd really like to know, you know, what would you like to see happen? And um, what would you like to see released? If you could go a little bit into that, and maybe um, if you'd care to share uh, some of the behavior you saw um, during the incident, that might you know shed some light on all the things we've been talking about. I would really appreciate to know a little bit more.
did you witness the, um, you know, like there must have been security at the event. Or was security, um, you know, helping, like organize or, or direct yeah. or. Now, oh, well, I, I had another. Now, I'm sure you were interviewed by the police after all of this. I mean, are the police still in contact with you? Are they updating you on developments or, or anything? Or are they, you know, what's their behavior been uh, now since the shooting? Hey Shannon, you sent me that um, video from that night. Would you mind if I shared that, or should I just keep that to myself? No, go ahead. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just one uh, last question for me. Um, I, I mean, with such a, a traumatic experience, um, I heard that they were offering um, all sorts of services uh, to the people that were there. I, you know, did. You, did they come and offer you any sort of um, help in, in any way, whether through counseling or, you know, uh, being a survivor of a great trauma? That, that's still pretty bad, on it? Yeah, it's healed up, but it's, um, it, it was painful and all that. <clears throat> Can't come back. That's good. Yeah. Do you have an opinion on the charities that have started up? Because they had the one that was the uh, Vegas Strong, where they collected, I think it was $25 million, and then I think they put out like forty thousand dollars, and then they turned around and said it was too complicated to decide who should get it or not, and that they were just going to donate it to different corporations. Do you have any kind of opinion about that? I think all that money should go to the families of the victims that were shot and murdered. 
nobody knows where. Oh. Yeah, no, nobody yeah, knows. They don't even know. The company is there for <coughs> runs. There's a reason it's going to go through. But <laughs> the other thing about that is there was a lot when it was really when it had first happened, like within the first week. There was a lot of stuff about like donating food and uh, and donating money to cover medical bills. And really, like my opinion should be like that. Somebody who was involved in that shouldn't even have a medical bill. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever isn't covered by some kind of donations should be covered by either the city or the, the casinos. And also, people were donating food. And, you know, you look at MGM, they have, what, 10 casinos in Vegas, and all, every one of them has a buffet. So why should people have to be dragging food down there for, to feed people? when these casinos probably throw out enough food to feed the whole city in, in one day. That's true. Yeah, um, now do you feel any, um, well, I mean, how do you feel about the, the, the casino and the hotel itself and their, um, you know, uh, that it happened on their watch and at their event? I mean, do you have any sort of feeling towards them at all? So that just goes to show that the Mandalay Bay really, they said they instituted some security measures, but really they didn't change anything since it's happened. Well, they, they, changed, they changed the numbers of the hotel. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. That'll keep everyone safe. Yeah. Hey, um, you, you know that they took the, um, <coughs> the event site and they're, they're turning it into <coughs> a, um, a training center. Yeah, SWAT. Uh, SWAT for, for SWAT. Well, um, do you think that's an appropriate uh, thing? Do you think maybe they should have used that area for maybe something else? Maybe put in a, a permanent memorial or, I mean, something other than something that perpetuates the like violence and, and the thought of uh, what happened there, you know, uh, in a violent way, maybe something more peaceful? Right, so they never contacted they, you about that that area and the use of the area. They, they never reached out to the victims and asked them what they would like to see. It would help it them help heal. Them. Mm. Well, one yeah. of the things about that is they are, there is a concerted effort not to have a memorial on the Strip because they don't want to remind tourists of that. They don't want people to, to feel threatened by it. The one memorial that they have is in downtown Vegas, um, which is, I think, four miles from where it actually happened. And last week they had an article, I think it was in the RJ, talking about how everybody at the Mandalay Bay has moved on and nobody thinks about it anymore. And, and that was the general gist of the article is that they want people just to forget everything. And Lombardo had his famous uh, or infamous uh, quote about a month ago where he said that, you know, it's important that we forget and just move on. And that's part of the reason why the investigation hasn't been properly done is because they don't want to drag out all that stuff and they don't want to remind everybody and they especially don't want tourists thinking about coming to Vegas and that it's a threat. The problem with that, though, is because they're not doing a proper investigation and because they're not getting to the bottom of what actually happened and the flaws in security that allowed it to happen, 
they're making it less safe and they're making it more likely that it might happen again because they're not addressing the issues that led to that. Yeah. Um, all right. Hey, Shannon, I wanted to uh, thank you for coming on. You guys got any more questions for Shannon? No, I, I do appreciate you coming on and, and being so candid and being able to speak about such a traumatic event. Um, the people listening and the people that will see this uh, gives them a little better insight. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to thank you and uh, your wife for everything that you guys have done, um, you know, for truth and transparency and just um trying to uh you know seek answers and not forget and move on like they'd like everyone to do um yeah. is there anything you'd like to say i mean you know that the people should know before we go um yeah uh well i know one thing all the survivors they're never gonna forget and there's a lot of them um i talk to them almost every day Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you and goodbye. All right. Have a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in regards to that uh, land deal where MGM donated that plot of the shooting site, uh, I mean, that's a multi million dollar plot of land that they donated to Metro. Um, If you ask me, that's a huge conflict of interest. Um, So not only has MGM donated the maximum amount allowed to Lombardo's first campaign, his re-election campaign. Um, they're also donating, you know, multi-million dollar plot of land for a new SWAT headquarters. And I think that has to do with, you know, Metro covering for MGM's legal liability and massaging timelines and doing whatever they can to, um, you know, protect their legal liability. For yeah. Sure. yeah, that's at the very least the image of a payback for not you know, for protecting their liability, mm-hmm. which is basically, in my opinion, 90% of the flaws in the investigation are based on trying to cover up liability, mm-hmm. either for MGM or for Metro. Yeah, yeah. And that's for sure. I, I mean, the, the whole idea of a, a SWAT headquarters um, down mm-hmm. on the strip, I, the, the visual of it is just um, unsettling. I mean, the, before I lived here, of course, like most people, I, I came here uh, for vacations. And Vegas has always held like a certain mystique that it was gambling and, and fun and, you know, <coughs> and being able to be a little more free than a lot of other places, you know, with the liberal drinking and uh, gambling. And, and now the thought that there'll probably be tons more of uh, militarized police uh, downtown it uh, just doesn't sit well. I, I don't see it, it mixing. Mm-hmm. It um, just seems like a bad visual. Well, that's, that's also one of the unintended consequences of that sort of thing. And it ties into the school shootings because when you look at the police that are in schools before Columbine, more or less, more, more often than not, the kind of police presence was security guards. And after Columbine, there was a concerted effort to create a police force within the schools. The problem is they haven't stopped any shootings. There hasn't been a single time that somebody went to a school to shoot it and one of the cops stopped them. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an example of Florida where they, they explicitly did not go in and try to stop them. Correct. But the thing is, what they are doing is they're arresting children mm-hmm. for doing stuff that children do. Mm -hmm. So the problem is when you have police and they're especially when they're just sitting around, they act like police. Mm -hmm. So they're already harassing people on the strip. They're already harassing the performers, locals, homeless people, anybody that they deem not a tourist. um, Yeah. Anybody that they deem. Yeah. That that they're not profiting off of, basically, or that is in competition with the casinos in the case of the performers. So what happens is you're going to have these cops down there who are, they're already in the mindset of harassing people, and now you're going to have even more cops there, and you're going to have really militarized cops. You're going to have a SWAT team, and they're going to act like police, and they're going to go out and they're going to harass people on the strip, and they're going to 
just create more mm-hmm. issues. Yeah, it's going to look like a city under siege. And the yeah. stuff that they're like harassing people on are the things that people talk about that they want to come to Vegas for. The crazy performers, the, the ability to walk down the street with a beer in your hand, mm-hmm. you know, from one casino to the next. And basically just like being able to be free and, and do stuff that you can't do in other cities is the stuff that the cops are cracking down on now. Yeah. And for some reason, Vegas can't figure out that right now there's Native <laughs> American casinos 20 miles outside of most people's cities. And we're going to reach a point where people aren't going to want to get on a plane and spend $400 to come to Vegas and be bored for a week. Mm-hmm. Right, or, or harassed every time they step out of their casino or hotel room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a couple things I wanted to say in regard to school shootings. And um, so out here in Vegas, we have CCSD um, and the the guy running against Lombardo actually had the idea of doing away with CCSD and just putting Metro in schools. Like, I think that's, I mean, we, that is not the answer, you know, that you're just going to have more police brutality against kids. Well, um, it's, it's, you know, I, I think it's intentional. That's, that's the intent of doing that. Um, I mean, this, the school system from its inception was to train children to be uh, workers and obey workers or soldiers one of the other. right and that's what the, it looks so, like they're trying to do is they're going to turn it into a prison i mean they want metal well, detectors you, and well have you looked at the the shape of the school buildings they have courtyards and inner courtyards very little windows they, yeah it's like a prison. um you know i have a son that went here and it's insane they um they keep pushing more and more uh they were more concerned about dress codes than the curriculum I mean, it's not that, uh, it's like Vegas is top on the list of good schools. In fact, we're at the bottom, mm-hmm. uh, way at the bottom. So what they were doing is not working. It is not working. We're not producing better students. We're not producing smarter students. Uh, we're, we're just creating havoc and, and extra stress on the children. So, and, and that's because the goal isn't to teach children. It's not education for the goal. It's the, indoctrination the, yeah the main the main goal of school the school system is to shape society and the the vision of the government that runs those schools mm-hmm. and that they do a good job with you know i'm i'm you know the the, the police officers in schools frighten me to death um i mean you know i'm with um nevada cop block and and of course in that we uh watch a lot of videos Mm-hmm. of uh, police brutality and there were, it was a large number uh, that were coming out of the school district uh, having to do with students and, and we're talking about our children mm-hmm. uh, these aren't hardened criminals these aren't uh, I mean they're children and they're treating them like adults oh yeah uh, knocking their teeth out body slamming them you know tasing them yeah. tasing them intimidation yeah. um, you know and, and that was not something I wanted for my child I mean, this is not what I consider to be a good path to be going down. So, I mean, you know, the school district meetings and, and parents could get out there and express, um, you know, we don't want armed uh, people in our school uh, either way. I mean, you know, there should be no armed guards. There's only one reason to have the armed people uh, when you have that many children. You know what's going to happen. Um, they're going to use those weapons if they have them available, and they're going to use them on the children if they feel threatened, which mm-hmm. the uh, police department always seems to feel threatened, either from cell phones or wallets or shadows. And then they're saying armed teachers. I mean, what? <laughs> that's not a good idea either if you talk to some. I mean, most teachers are pretty level-headed, but you've got some hothead teachers, you know. Well, it's Sit reactionary. Down, Timmy. Yeah. <laughs> The, the whole well, thing is I, reactionary. I, 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 I personally think if a, if a teacher has a weapon, they have like a concealed carry permit or whatever, they should be allowed to, to have it. But we shouldn't be turning teachers into police yeah, force. There shouldn't be a program to do that. But I absolutely agree that if teachers are licensed to conceal carry, they should have the right to do so. I don't believe right. in gun-free zones because that's what they, they become a target. That's just my personal opinion. That's where these shootings happen. You know, if they have a choice to go to a school that's, you know, there may be some teachers that are 
concealed carrying or if you have a choice to go to a school where you know there's they're all sitting ducks which one is the next school shooter going to go to you know so there's it's it's a it's a complicated it's a it's a difficult dilemma for sure well i'm i'm not so sure i mean you know if they would focus more on things like conflict resolution in the schools mm-hmm. i mean you know that they have no problem teaching things like the pledge of allegiance and you know having the um, if they would work with the students from an early age, I mean, the anti-bullying <clears throat> campaigns, yeah. um, you know, came into effect after, but what, they're not really effective. They really have to get in there, and, and they have to start. Like I said, the conflict resolution would be a great place for them to start teaching the children uh, how to resolve their issues, mm-hmm. uh, how to identify at-risk students. Yeah, mental well, health. Also, yeah, <laughs> mental health is absolutely paramount. Um, and it's not that the teachers don't know. They're kids. They sit there with them. You know, Ooh. I mean, you know, we had the same teachers, you know, all through, you know, elementary school and then middle school. Uh, the teacher turnover wasn't that great. So the, the teachers are there. They see the children. They should be able to identify uh, at-risk students. It's not like they don't hear what the other students say or their behavior toward certain students. Yeah, so. there's, there's a couple things about that. And one of the things is the nature of the school system doesn't, um, lend itself to conflict resolution it actually creates conflicts and that's why you have so much bullying because the only way children know how to interact with each other is through this hierarchical system and authoritarian yeah. in which they Absolutely. have to assert themselves and compete with other people correct and because they they haven't um, grown into their personality yet and they don't know like who they are that's the easiest way to do that is by physically um, abusing other people mm-hmm. I was and thinking the other, maybe. Well, the other thing is that teachers themselves, you know, like criticizing the school system isn't a criticism of teachers necessarily mm-hmm. because teachers are a victim of the school system as much as the children are. It, yeah, their job is right. more difficult because of the nature of the school system. And teachers that are the good teachers who go in and try to to teach people and try to make a difference are often – either not not able to do that or they're prevented from doing that and they're oftentimes these teachers that are just able to be obedient to the system are the ones that advance and the others are filtered mm-hmm. out just like a lot of the other sort of governments government uh, functions that's for sure and so how are we doing on time yeah 50 minutes five zero. Oh. And the Facebook recording came in broken. Like, it's really bad. Okay. You're probably not going to want to use it. All <laughs> right. That's okay. Well, <laughs> that's why I hey, we're, this, <coughs> we're welcome on our first show. So, yeah. you know, anybody who's curve. out there listening, yeah. Fa- Facebook keeping us down again. I believe, yeah. I believe that's true. I think Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> personally is responsible for that. Well, you yeah. saw that the uh, yeah. stock plummeted, and it's. Uh, yeah, 50, you know, 50 minutes ago it plummeted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Um, so you want to get into some of the events coming up? Or? Well, we could do events. Yeah. Well, let yeah. me let me do the events, and then right. we'll have a few minutes at the end, and, and we can discuss some other stuff, and uh, you know, I'll talk about maybe what's going to be coming up um, in the later shows, which would be uh, pretty good. So um, on Thursday, April twelfth, there'll be a free screening of the award-winning documentary on Las Vegas police corruption, what happened in Vegas at the Center for Science and Wonder, and located at 1651 East Sunset Road. And there will be a, a question and answer session after that featuring Ramsey and other local people that were in the movie. Yep. They're going to have free pizza, refreshments. Oh, okay. Right. Don't yep. forget that. Nope, nope. It was all right here, man. So, and yeah, the free pizza for sure and soda. You guys would love that. Um, we suggest that you uh, RSVP on Facebook at What Happened in Vegas, free film screening, Seesaw, and that's C-S-A-W. Or you could call them if you need more information at 725-696-SEESAW. That's 725-696-2729. And visit them at the Center for Science and Wonder.org. Also, if I can plug... uh Ramsey's website it's sure what happened in Vegas the movie.com um, you can also get it on Amazon iTunes 
If you haven't seen it yet, definitely check it out. It exposes, you know, racial profiling, police brutality, lies, cover-ups within, and just outright murder within the uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Yep. So it's a free film screening. You guys will enjoy it. I've seen it many times. It's um, There's one documentary you should see this year. This would be the one for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, next on, uh, we have April 21st to 22nd. Uh, it's 8 a.m. Saturday through 6 p.m. Sunday. Uh, I'm sure there's a break in between. Uh, we have the street medic training. And this is what the average person can do. You get some basic medical training uh, in any sort of crisis situation, um, it gives you basic uh, CPR, uh, first aid. Um, if you're at the park with your children and somebody falls down, how to check for a broken bone, how to bandage a knee. Um, and then it gets pretty extensive. If you're at a uh, demonstration or at a march, uh, it teaches about you know the signs of heat stroke and uh, how to do that as well as getting into um, if there was conflict and, and somebody was injured, so they do bone setting and what to do uh, until you can get the uh, EMS there on site and how to protect the folks. It's a really good thing, and that's street medic training. Um, what you would do is uh, you'd call Ming at 510-331-2202, and that number again is 510 331 Two two zero two, and they'll give you all the information you need to sign up. I know that the seating is limited. This is not the first training we've had, and it fills up fast. So you really got to get out there and do that. And then, of course, we have the uh, on May first, we have our twelfth annual May Day in Las Vegas March and Rally. So that's going to be happening uh, right here where we're broadcasting from. It's at the Historic Commercial Center and uh, Sahara Avenue. And that will be from 5.30 to 6.30. And at the end of the march, we'll be rallying from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, Come and join us for worker rights, immigrant rights, and human rights. So that's kind of an important thing. Uh, the, and you can also find all, all the events on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash ACAB radio. And remember, all cats are beautiful. That's right. ACAB radio. All chihuahuas are beautiful. <laughs> uh, all cats are bastards. That's true. True. Uh, if anybody's from New England, uh, you know, that has special meaning. Uh, also, next week, uh, we got something special planned if you guys want to. Tune in. I definitely encourage that. We got uh, something to do with Metro that we're going to be, uh, this should be sharing fun. with you guys. Yeah, so definitely yeah. check it out. That'll be a great thing. And uh, don't forget, join us every um, Sunday at 1030, Monday at 1130, and Wednesday at 1130 at Hunt Ridge Circle Park for our Food Not Bombs community picnics, where building community is our one priority. So we want to thank everybody for uh, listening. Uh, please share, invite your friends to listen to the podcast. Uh, the only way we could get this information out there is if people hear it, and we can invite everybody since we don't know everybody, but you guys share on Facebook, share with your friends, let them know to listen in. Um, as things roll, uh, we'll be doing more and more. Uh, we'll be able, or you will be able to call in or text in questions or comments. The Facebook page is always open, and uh, we really want to hear some feedback on what you'd like to hear and what you'd like to see in upcoming shows. Also, we're going to be, um, we're going to set up a website where uh, we're going to have video and um, if there's related news articles or um, like uh, content videos and whatnot, we'll also share that on there as well. And don't forget uh, Nevada Cobblock, org. There we go. Thank you all.